Can everyone see my screen? Give me a digital thumbs up or a real life thumbs up. Great. Okay. So this is kind of my Oh, all good. Audio good. Thumbs up for audio. Okay. So this is Planet Microbes number 13. We just had our one year anniversary last month. And we were also just saying that none of us have any recollection of what we talked about last month. So that's a great sign, but onward and upward into- Stromatolites. Stromatolites, thank you, yeah. Um, so last time stromatolites, this time volcanic microbes. And this Planet Microbes is inspired by the volcano that just erupted in Iceland last month. I will not even attempt to pronounce the name of this volcano, but we'll just call it the Icelandic volcano. Um, despite the fact that I, that two of my very closest colleagues are volcanologists, I did not hear about this volcano's eruption from them. I heard about it from the singer Bjork's Instagram. So that was who broke this news to me, but nevertheless, I'm sure everyone has seen read the news about it and seen drone footage of it. It's this amazing um, once in our lifetime um, event that has happened that has drawn tens of thousands of tourists to come and see this volcano erupting, as you can see them all lined up here. And this volcanic eruption, um, it's the first time that this has happened in 800 years. And it was caused by a series of small earthquakes. And then the volcano finally sort of split and erupted on March 19th, so less than a month ago. And this has inspired me to think about the connections between volcanic activity and microbes. And so the paper that we're talking about today is one of my favorite papers that's come out in the past two years. So instead of talking about something a paper that has come out in the past um, couple weeks, as we normally do. We're taking, um, stepping back in our time machine to 2018, when the Kilauea volcano erupted, and thinking about um, how the microbiology could be impacted in this current volcano based on what we learn about this past volcanic event. But before we dive into the paper, just a little bit of background on volcano chemistry and what this might have to do with the microbial with the microbial cycle and microbial ecology. So here is a diagram of um, a volcanic plume and all of the different elements that are within that that plume. So this is um, sodium and magnesium and iron and silica and sulfur and nitrogen, all of these different elements that are being taken up from deeper within the earth and then released into the place where we all walk and live and every critter tries to make a living. And this isn't just constrained to where the volcano erupts, obviously. So I went on the USGS webpage and they have this nifty tool where you can model how far a volcanic plume will travel. So this is um, an example, a toy example of if Mount St. Helens were to erupt today or rather two days ago when I made this simulation, if that were to happen two days ago at the same strength as the massive 1980 eruption, which is pictured here, how far that huge cloud of stuff that's been brought up from deep in the earth would travel. And this is just eight hours in this diagram. So the warmer colors are a higher concentration of chemicals in that plume. And then of course you can see where that travels. So in just eight hours, it's made its way all the way across the continental US and into the North Atlantic Ocean on the East coast of Canada. And that's just in eight hours. So you can imagine how far that plume would travel um, over even more time. And then that makes us ask the question, why do we care about this plume chemistry? What, is, what are all of the different impacts that this can have? Does anyone want to um, share something vocally or in the chat about why we care about um, this plume chemistry and how far it travels and the things that it can do?
Well, if it happened underneath the ocean, it could be the basis of all life. But um, I'm, I don't really know above above the ocean. Yeah, that's Sibel raises a great point. Um, one of the hypotheses for the origin of life is that they were sparked in hydrothermal plumes or deep um, volcanoes that are beneath the, the surface of the ocean at the seafloor. So that's one thought. Um, for us today, when this stuff happens, they it grounds planes, it blots out the blots out the sun. Um, there is, as I think, yeah, as Kamal said in the chat, um, toxicity. There are some pretty gnarly chemicals in here that are not healthy to breathe for humans, for animals, for for trees. Sherry raises a great point. Yes, they do cause really beautiful sunsets, um, similar to the wildfires in in California, um, it's a pretty sunset for for a bad reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what what no one has brought up though is that these chemical these chemicals that are within the plume are um, fertilizer essentially for phytoplankton, and phytoplankton need these to grow, and. Um, why do we care about phytoplankton? If you've gone to a lot of these planet microbes, these are a recurring theme. It's my favorite thing to talk about. But phytoplankton are these critical microscopic plants that keep the gears of our planet turning. They live in the water, everywhere that there's water and sunlight. And about 50% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from phytoplankton. So if you think trees are important, phytoplankton are the the other side of that coin and just as important. So I like to say, take a breath, thank a phytoplankton because they are responsible for about 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. And just like trees and plants, they're taking in carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas from the atmosphere and turning that into sugars um, and biomass to grow. So they're the, these super important um, engines that really keep our planet a habitable place and prevent climate change and, and all, of, all of that stuff. But I said before that phytoplankton can grow everywhere that there is water and enough sunlight for them to photosynthesize. But if you look at this false colored image of Earth where the warmer colors are higher concentrations of chlorophyll, the um, pigment that enables plants to photosynthesize, um, some regions of the ocean are essentially deserts where phytoplankton have a really hard time eking out a living. So does anyone know why certain regions of the ocean are technically deserts where very few of these microscopic plants can grow? There's the ocean gyres. I used to teach about this in earth science. And so yeah. they're, they're not getting the circulation of the nutrients. Exactly, and you can see these gyres, where's my mouse? So you can see these main ocean gyres, there are five of them um, in the North, North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and the North and South Pacific. And these are basically big, enormous whirlpools of water that spin around. They have very little input from land, and so they have very low nutrients, and so, just like you need to water your plants and give them nitrogen and phosphorus and iron to grow, um, phytoplankton need the exact same things. And in some regions of the ocean, um, like here in the South Pacific has the, is the most nutrient limited in the entire uh, global ocean. There's just vanishingly low concentrations of nutrients and phytoplankton really, really struggle to eke out a living. That's why if you go on a boat to the middle of the ocean and you look over the side, um, the water is crystal clear, blue, almost purple in some places. And that's because there is such a low concentration of these microscopic critters um, that um, they just don't have enough nutrients to, to grow there. And so different nutrients are limiting the phytoplankton that grow in different regions. In the North Atlantic, the concentration of phosphorus is really low. Um, in, in other regions like the North and South Pacific, it's the concentration of, um, of nitrogen that is really low. 
And in the Southern Ocean, this part around Antarctica, it's the concentration of iron. So there would be lots of lots more phytoplankton growing there, but iron is really low in these parts. So that is what makes these different regions of the ocean technically a desert, even though um, there's water as far as the eye can see. So that brings us to the Mount Kilauea eruption of 2018. That happened on the big island of Hawaii. It's right here, right on the um, southeastern coast of the big island. And this was a pretty big eruption. Um, the, the lava went all the way down to the coast and then went into the water, as you can see here, where the, the steam is rising up. And it was just massive quantities of lava that was flowing, 50 to 100 meters cubed per second flowed into the ocean for two months from June to July, uh, June to August in 2018. Um, that's a lot of lava, a lot of lava. And so the interesting thing about all of the chemicals that are in the stuff that the volcano is bringing up from deep in, in the center of the earth. And the interesting part about that happening in Hawaii is that Hawaii is essentially smack dab in the middle of one of these ocean deserts. So, oh wow, this is not to scale of Hawaii. That got much bigger than I meant. But um, Hawaii is under here, this enormous circle that I've drawn by accident somewhere. And you can see it's in this region of the ocean that has really, really low chlorophyll all year round. It's a place where um, phytoplankton just really cannot get the stuff that they need to grow. And so the big question is all of the, the chemicals in the ash and the lava flowing into the ocean, how did that alter the ecology and the activities of the phytoplankton that live in this region? Did, did that make a difference? Did it change who was growing, how much they were growing, how much CO2 they were fixing into sugar to grow? Um, and that is what the scientists who wrote this paper sought to investigate. So that brings us to the paper we're discussing tonight on that um, 2018 Kilauea eruption. Before we dig into this paper, does anyone have any questions or comments or did I miss anything from the chat? Did. Oh yeah, Cecilio says phytoplankton, key part of the food chain. Yeah, they're really at the very bottom of the of the food chain. If not for them, then we wouldn't have um, the the larger fish or whales that we eat. So they're really um, really at the bottom. Yeah, and it also uh, changes the competent uh, composition of the oceans as well too. Because without was it even with lava vents at the bottom of the ocean, certain sea life lived down there because of the phytoplankton that are present in that in that environment. But as the phytoplankton deteriorate, you also lose the animals in that environment and things start to convert and you start to lose the currents. And it's just it's just a downward spiral all the way, man. Yeah. I mean, even though phytoplankton only live in the upper 200 meters of the ocean, so that's about as far as light can penetrate um, in the middle of the open ocean, those phytoplankton grow and then they die and they form marine snow that ultimately makes its way to the bottom of the ocean and is recycled by bacteria as it makes its way down. So even though they're, they're growing in this tiny okay. skim on the surface, um, they really are, are fueling everything with the exception of those um, subsea hydrothermal vent communities. Um, those are fueled only, they're, they're basically decoupled from the sun. So that's the one place on earth that um, plants or phytoplankton really aren't the base of the food web. I think I saw a hand raise, but now, but my, my, little, my little Brady Bunch screen wasn't big enough to see whose it was. But feel free to post a question in the chat or raise your hand again. I'm glad that you're doing a presentation like this because a lot of people aren't aware of the traumatic things that happen from volcanic activity like the 
transition in the oceans. When you have lava flows into the oceans, it changes the whole composition of the sea. It, it just it just throws all the biology out and, and the chemistry gets out of whack. And like you said, it slows the currents down and people, any, you don't have to be a scientist to realize once we lose that current in the ocean, basically all life will cease to function on this planet. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's a topic for, for another planet microbes, the slowing down ocean circulation, something that I think is super interesting. Yeah, people don't realize how, or as we will see later in this talk, the the ability of, of phytoplankton to grow is driven by this large scale ocean circulation that is bringing up nutrients from the deep ocean and bringing up uh, and, and taking in heat and really regulating the climate in all these different ways. Um, and we have no idea how us messing with it, for lack of a better term, is changing things. So Daisy asks, when the phytoplankton die, and fall down as marine snow, would that material still affect the deepest depths? For sure, yeah, that's what the sediment on the bottom of the ocean is made of, actually, is this um, detritus that's falling down from, raining down just like snow from the surface. So in, in most parts of the ocean, that is, those phytoplankton raining down are what is fueling the bacteria that live below, um, the, the fish that live in, the abyssal ocean, it's all fueled by the critters that live in those top 200 meters of, of the water. Yes, and the silts, and then when it combines with um, soils or any kind of other silt, like, like, you know, like everyone knows the Nile, you can see from space the silt coming out the Nile being deposited into the ocean. When you get phytoplankton involved in there, you get a conversion that they actually can latch onto things and can cause other things to grow. So it's, it, it's very helpful to the environment, but it also can decimate it as well. Yeah, critters love to be attached to particles, like a little sofa for microbes. There's another question. Are scientists able to turn the plankton into something friendly to, um, or that can affect the environment? So that's a really good question. There's a lot of, um, geoengineering um, type researchers who think about, you know, there are these ocean deserts. If we could just make more phytoplankton grow, then maybe they could take up more carbon dioxide and we would not have to worry about driving our large um, SUVs or whatever. And maybe that's, maybe if we could just fertilize the ocean, that could solve the climate crisis. Um, the problem with that is, that the ocean is really big, as you might have noticed, like how do you fertilize the entire ocean? Um, the other problem is that um, when you do fertilize the ocean, it's like a really complex system with many different species of microbes and we just have no control over which critter is going to win that arms race and grow. So um, in small trials where they've tried to fertilize the Southern Ocean with iron, the species that have grown are a particular type of diatom that produces a neurotoxin called domoic acid. So that's not good. Um, so that there's just um, there's just too much, um, too many unknowns about doing that. That my personal thought is that it's not a good idea. Also, all of that iron immediately precipitates and sinks, and you get a bloom for like one day. So that's not. Not so interesting great. that you know maybe that's lacking there for a reason yeah i mean it's just that's all that's it's been that way for the whole time that um humans have been around at least is that these regions of the ocean are are limited in what they're limited for so but interesting that they're limited for different things i mean that really i find that very interesting that they're not all limited by the same nutrient yeah, it just, it really depends on the physics of the, of the environment. So in the North Atlantic, which is, um, it's very, um, it's much smaller than the Pacific in terms of the, the width from continent to continent. So they get a lot of input of dust from the Sahara, and that has nutrients like iron in it. And that iron enables nitrogen fixers to grow. 
And so those nitrogen fixers can turn dinitrogen gas into a form that's available to use like little fertilizer factories. But in the North and South Pacific, those are really far from, from land. So there's no way that dust is gonna make it that far. So without dust, you don't have iron. And then without iron, that's a critical part of um, that a critical part of the cellular machinery that nitrogen fixers use. And so there are no nitrogen fixers and then you're limited for nitrogen as the main limiting nutrient. And then in the Southern Ocean, um, there's lots of upwelling, but again, um, there's no iron. So yeah, it's super cool. Oceanographers devote their entire careers to looking at um, the, the differences in different oceans and um, how how phytoplankton make a living there. Because it's changing too. Another question about chemi uh, careers in chemistry than other sciences. Um, I have no idea. And then another question, um, if we were to fertilize the ocean and produce too much phytoplankton, would it lead to dead zones from the increase in bacteria eating the detritus. Exactly, yeah. And that's another, um, a huge growing problem in the ocean are these dead zones or oxygen minimum zones. And those are caused by huge influxes of nutrients to the surface ocean. So that can be caused by fertilizer runoff when fertilizer is used too much in agriculture. That sparks phytoplankton to grow really, really fast and then they die and they sink. And as they're sinking bacteria, um, it's like being at a buffet. They go hog wild. They are heterotrophs like us. So they are um, respiring out CO2 and consuming oxygen to grow. And then that is causing these dead zones of low oxygen. And you can imagine that if you were a fish who lived there, um, you you literally suffocate in the dead zones because you can't um there's no oxygen for you to breathe so yeah that's another downside of these large i mean to some extent we're all, already fertilizing the ocean with increased fertilizer runoff from agriculture we put on way too much um so yeah it's no good all right if there are are there any other questions before we dive into this Kilauea paper. Nada, okay, let's go. So this paper is all about figuring out, did this massive eruption of the Kilauea volcano, did this spark a phytoplankton bloom? And if so, what happened to the phytoplankton and to the environment? So this is the first, um, the first figure from the paper. So they first wanted to, to model how far um, the, the water affected by, the, um, by this eruption would travel in the North Pacific Ocean. So they ran this computer model where they released a, um, a dye, a computerized dye in their model, and that's the yellow here and then looked at where that would travel based on the, um, based on the, the chemistry of the water, the known currents and the physics of the ocean. And then they compared that to satellite images of the chlorophyll. So just like in, um, in the slide that I showed a couple of slides ago, the warmer colors are a higher concentration of phytoplankton or chlorophyll, and the cooler colors are lower concentrations. So they, they saw that, and you can follow around on this timeline here, um, this, first, this first panel is when the first fissures um, show up and when the lava starts to um, enter the ocean is this image here. So you can see this little dot of um, lava affected water. And then over the course of the month that synthetic dye um, in their simulation moves around and curls um, up and over the big island and 
to the west. And the, the chlorophyll patch follows this exact same pattern. So this was their first indication that um, because this, this chlorophyll patch was following the same path as their computer simulations, that it was sparked by um, this volcano impacted water. The other bit of evidence, um, you know, this could just happen, happen naturally. Maybe there was a lot of wind that caused upwelling and that caused a phytoplankton bloom. But what they noticed is that this was more chlorophyll than had been seen in this part of the ocean for the past almost two decades. So it was this anomalously high um, bloom that um, was the second bit of evidence. And then when the lava stopped in August, um, that bloom went away. You can see that um, by the lack of chlorophyll in this bottom panel. And then they wanted to figure out um, what was happening with these microbes that were growing in this chlorophyll patch. So they went to sea on actually a ship that I've been on um, way back in the day when I was an oceanographer, the research vessel Ka'imikai o Kanaloa from the University of Hawaii. This is a picture that I took um, several years ago, right before I got on the ship. It was the most seasick that I have ever been in my entire life um, was on this ship. My lab was um, right up right up here where you can't see in a little container. It was horrible, but good memories, I guess. Yes, exactly. Um, and then this is a picture of the RV KOK from a different ship in the middle of the North Pacific that I took. So good memories, a little plug for my photo skills, um, but they went out to the middle of the ocean and um, actually took samples of what was happening right as this bloom was going on. So in the volcano bloom, um, they found that some nutrients that they were tracking were really closely tied to the amount of chlorophyll that was in the water. So they saw that nitrogen compounds, this key limiting nutrient in the North Pacific, that was um, the amounts that they saw which is here on this panel F, um, really closely tied to the amount of chlorophyll. Silicic acid, that is essentially glass. And that's a key ingredient that diatoms who build little glass houses for themselves that they need to grow. So they also saw that the chlorophyll tracked that spike and then other trace metals as well. They also found that some critical nutrients like iron and other metals were actually sinking out of the water column really rapidly. So they were glomming on to particles or precipitating and then sinking out of the water column. And then they looked at which species were blooming and they found both that these blooms were highly productive. So they were, they were taking up a lot of CO2 and turning it into biomass and the species that was most abundant was this particular type of diatom that's pictured here called skeletonema. So you can actually see the, the glass shell that connects, um, that connects different sister cells in this chain of, of this particular diatom. So you can actually see um, how much silica they would need to grow. So uh, there's a question in the chat about um, what type of tools they use for the data. So oceanography is a lot of throwing really expensive pieces of equipment overboard and um, taking samples that way. So the main piece of equipment is this, um, this piece of equipment pictured here. It's called a rosette or a CTD. So um, these, are hollow tubes that you, you can see here, the, the crane will lift it overboard. And then these tubes are open on the top and the bottom. And then when you get to a particular place or depth that you wanna take a sample, you can fire those bottles and they will snap shut on the top and the bottom. And then you can haul that overboard. And then you can see the little, um, the little spigot here that you can take your water sample out and um, do whatever experiments you want on the chemistry, or you can sequence the DNA or the RNA. 
and see who's growing in there or what genes they're turning on or off. Um, these scientists also used um, autonomous gliders so they are like robots that you throw overboard and they um, take samples of the water. Um, and they also use satellite, um, satellites that take pictures of the surface of the ocean and you can see how much chlorophyll there is. And what else? And computer simulations and computer models that sort of look at what happens in an idealized ocean if you feed in um, all of the different parameters of the ocean at that time. So yeah, a whole, a whole bevy of tools um, from this, this huge team of scientists that were all out on that boat at the same time. So the circling back to the chemistry, they did notice some something weird about the about the nitrogen in this environment. So they they saw that the species composition, the gene expression, and the chemistry all showed that nitrate was the um, key um, chemical compound that was fueling this bloom. Um, but the lava didn't have any nitrate in it, and they didn't see any nitrogen fixers who were growing out there. So like I said um, before, the one of the reasons why the North Pacific Ocean is limited by nitrogen is because um, there is a really low abundance of nitrogen fixers. And so they weren't growing here in this bloom and there wasn't a lot of nitrate provided by the lava. So something else must have been going on to fuel this, this bloom. So they backed up this observation by sequencing the DNA of the microbes that they sampled in the bloom. And here is um, this particular diatom, skeletonema, that was most abundant. And they didn't see any species of nitrogen fixer. And they knew from the chemistry of the lava that there was no nitrogen in the lava. And they also backed up their, this observation by looking at the genes the skeletonema species were turning on. So they could see um, the highest abundance of these nitrate transport and utilization genes. So this, this final part about how they, how they figured out um, that nitrate was the key element or the, the, the key compound that was fueling this bloom and that it wasn't nitrogen fixers and that it wasn't coming from the lava is a little bit confusing because, I mean, it, it always, this, this part always confuses me as well. They used isotopes. And so um, isotopes are sort of like a fingerprint for different chemical compounds and the organisms who use them. So different enzymes will have a preference for using um, different isotopes. Um, so an isotope is a different number of, of protons and neutrons in an element. And there can be heavy nitrogen where it has extra and light nitrogen or the normal amount of um, the, the normal weight of that isotope. And different enzymes will selectively use different isotope concentrations or different bodies of water will have um, different isotopic ratios. So water from or lava nitrogen will have a different isotopic ratio than nitrogen that's made by nitrogen fixers and nitrogen that's made by, um, by bacteria that live in the surface of the ocean. So um, I recognize that this is very confusing and maybe I confused it more by my sort of piecemeal explanation. Does anyone have any questions about using isotopes as a chemical fingerprint? I know they do it with ice cores a lot, so I've seen that. Yeah, so you can basically, if you take a standard sample of the nitrogen isotopes from the surface seawater, from a nitrogen fixer, and from lava, then you have your, your base levels that you can use to compare. And then you can take an unknown sample 
and look at the isotopes in that unknown sample. So here it's um, the nitrogen in the water that these skeletonema were blooming in. And then you can say, okay, this is our unknown. What isotope ratio is, is this unknown most similar to from the nitrogen fixers, from the lava, from the surface water, from deep water? So that's what they did. Um, they basically are, are holding up the, the puzzle piece to see which one it matches most closely to. And so they did that. And what they found out is that really interestingly, it wasn't the, the ash that was fueling this phytoplankton bloom. And it wasn't um, chemicals from the lava. And it wasn't nitrogen fixers. It was sort of an even simpler and um, and kind of like you hit yourself on the side of the head when you realize, but the, the lava was flowing into the ocean and sinking. And then the lava, as we all know, is very hot. And the seawater at the bottom of the ocean is very cold and it's dense. And so when that lava was heating up the surrounding seawater, it was decreasing the density, making it more buoyant. And then that water warmed by the lava was floating up to the surface. This water that's really deep is rich in nutrients that have been regenerated by heterotrophic bacteria um, as, it, as they sink down to the bottom. And so this is um, basically a little, a, little, um, a little cache of really fertile water um, that rises to the surface. And that is what sparked this phytoplankton bloom. Um, so a couple of questions in the um, thing. Christine, drive safely. Um, lava process help and damage the surroundings. That is a great, a great question that we will get to in this slide that's up now. And then Sherry says, didn't they also look to see if the appropriate genes were turned on or off for the different pathways suggested by the isotope survey? They did, but I didn't want to go too deeply into that. But yeah, they back up all of this stuff by sequencing every single gene that's turned on and off in this bloom. So a really comprehensive analysis of everything these organisms are doing physiologically. So finally, all of this analysis sort of forces us to think about volcanoes through a different lens. Obviously, they, they can destroy property, they can, they are natural hazards that can lead to loss of life. Um, they've in the past been linked to mass extinctions. But what they found in this study by looking at this phytoplankton bloom is that the the photosynthetic critters that were growing in this bloom were fixing 10 million kilograms of CO2 per day. And that was the same magnitude as all of the carbon emitted by the eruption itself. So these phytoplankton were essentially canceling out some of the harmful um, greenhouse gas impacts of this volcanic bloom. And so you can envision um, scenarios where depending on how big this bloom is, where the volcano is on Earth, that um, these processes can basically cancel each other out. So maybe volcanoes aren't all bad. And throughout the course of Earth's evolution, maybe um, phytoplankton, or we need to be considering the roles of phytoplankton in mitigating some of the, the climate change impacts of these um, natural hazard events. So that brings me to the discussion portion. Um, before we break out into breakout rooms to discuss these, um, maybe we can all come together here as a group and we can uh, talk about any questions or comments or thoughts or musings. Let's see if I missed anything in the chat. Hi, guys. I have so, an question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Kamal. Yeah, it's a little bit adjacent. Um, so you mentioned like diatoms were one of the featured planktons or algae that were produced. And uh, you mentioned that they have a glass shell. Um, I guess the adjacent question is, 
are there like microbes that can digest this glass shell, like the heterotrophic bacteria you mentioned? Because glass seems like it's pretty robust, right? At least chemically. So yeah, that's Is such a good question. Yeah, they they eat around it. So um, certain larger um, or heterotrophic um, or mixotrophic phytoplankton will like spit out this feeding net that will surround like an external stomach that will surround a diatom digest everything but the silica and then spit out the empty shell um, you can see in zooplankton which eat phytoplankton their poop is made out of these shells so they eat everything and then poop it out and that sinks to the bottom of the ocean and you some geochemists will use the amount of silica in the they call it the siliceous ooze in the sediment. And that can tell you all different things about what the past earth was like in those, um, by looking at the amount of silica, siliceous ooze in those sediment cores. Um, and the, the interesting thing about these shells is that they, they're really heavy. So dead diatoms sink really fast. And so they are really rapidly shuttling all of that carbon that they're fixing into biomass, they're burying it in the bottom of the ocean really efficiently because they're so heavy. So super important for the climate. But yeah, no one can eat, no one can eat the glass, except that's, the diatoms. That's amazing. Thank you. Rec oh, someone asked about recommendations to watch later. So I have been enjoying the live feed of the Iceland volcano. Um, you can you can watch it like the Truman Show at all all points of time and see see what's going on there. I think a new fissure just opened up yesterday or on Monday, so that's exciting. I mean, it's slow because it's happening in real time, but it's very pretty. It's like you're there. Cecilio asked about sulfur dioxide levels. Yeah. So sulfur dioxide is something, is a, a toxic um, sulfur compound that is, is toxic. I don't, I don't know what else to say, but yeah, that it can be hazardous to health, um, greenhouse gas as well, and also carbon dioxide. So um, their phytoplankton don't, don't use sulfur dioxide um, and they have, Sulfur isn't something that we think of as a limiting nutrient for phytoplankton. So can scientists stop the eruption using advanced technologies? Could you stop an eruption? I don't think, no, I don't think so. I don't think there's anything they could do to stop the eruption, but there's a lot of research going on about how to predict that they're happening faster and faster and with more lead time before they do happen. And this is a major issue in the developing world um, where, where there's not a lot of money to have monitoring programs where they can have seismometers that test for the rumbles of the earth to see if, um, if there might be um, an earthquake that could trigger an eruption coming. So um, there is a lot of work in the volcanologist community to have international monitoring and sharing of wealth essentially to improve um, improve lead time and our ability to mitigate the damage that's caused when eruptions do happen. I don't know how you would stop it from a, a giant cork that you could plug the <laughs> unlikely. Yeah, some uses for, for sulfur that are good, but you don't want to breathe it in. Okay. Oh, and Sherry, it does. Oh yeah, and it can it can travel. I mean, the volcanoes can also the ash plumes can also fertilize terrestrial systems or cause acid rain. Um, so yeah, it's not just the ocean. So that's one thing maybe to discuss in. And I think it's not always bad. I mean, I mean, yeah. So maybe in the short term, it can be it can be toxic. But um, 
you know, sometimes there are areas that actually run low on these elements and that some of the way that they can actually get them is through big events like this. But I agree that in the short term, it can be too much in a certain area mm -hmm. and result in toxicity, but you sort of need some of this reinfusion back into the, to the cycle. And Christine, Christine, are you texting while driving? Just kidding. Um, I am not driving. My daughter has her permit, so that's oh, lovely. Okay. okay, good. Um, so, Earth Science for years. Hawaii is a hot spot that has blown a hole through the tectonic plate. Oh, that's a good point that I didn't even think of. Yeah. So, Hawaii is this active volcanic system that's going. <laughs> as we speak. So if I go all the way back to the picture of, where's Hawaii? Faces are blocking my, my view of Hawaii. Oh, here. So teeny tiny, but this is actually, you can see how the plates on earth are, are the arc of Hawaii is, it is a volcanic arc where the positioning of the islands are showing you how the this um, rupture, this volcano, has moved over geological time. So this is the oldest um, the oldest island. the vo The volcano erupted here um, a long, 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 long time ago. And then, as the plates shifted, then the volcano started erupting here. And then the plates shifted more. And then the volcano erupted here. And then we got to today, where the volcano um, is erupting as we speak. So it's an active volcano. And that is totally different than Iceland, I believe. But I don't know enough about volcanoes to know why or how that is different, or if they're bringing up um, different stuff from deep in the earth. That's a really good question. But yeah, like you say, um, this is, I think, a basaltic region, and then the Iceland one wouldn't be basalt, so maybe the chemicals are, are totally different. That's a question for a volcanologist. I'll ask my colleagues, or I'll ask Bjork. Why so, aren't the Iceland ones basaltic? So maybe they are basaltic too, but I did know, I noted that in this paper, they make a point of saying that this is a, this is basaltic. But I guess Iceland is in the middle of the ocean too. But yeah, I don't know enough. I don't know enough about volcanoes, but that's a good question. Volcanic soils, rich in nutrients. How do our scientists know it's in the inner core of the earth? So apparently that is a really, really hard question to answer. And you have to use all of these complex, like measuring how seismic waves travel exactly yeah Cibel, seismic waves so you have to measure like from one side to the other i guess or maybe in one spot like how how seismic waves wiggle as they go through the core of the earth and depending on how that wiggle chain changes it can tell you a bevy of info about what the core is made out of if it's solid if it's liquid if it's spinning yeah, whew, that is that is over my head a little bit too. But apparently, this is like a super big challenge in in geology. And then, why why doesn't the island split in half while the eruption is happening? Because the island is actually made out of the the lava from uh, volcanic eruptions of time times past. So I didn't write down this information, but it was in the paper, or maybe I read it in a different on a different site. But apparently, this volcanic eruption in 2018 actually added like several kilometers um, cubed of or squared of of new coast. So Hawaii was the Big Island of Hawaii was bigger after this eruption than before. So yeah. 
preventing against erosion. Sorry, the cats keep opening my Zoom room door. All right, any other questions or thoughts before we break into the breakout rooms? Oh, here's another. Oh yeah, that's Cecilio raises a good point. So warming around glaciers that could be caused by volcanic activities and um, a lot of glaciers around Iceland can hasten um, ice melt and cause cracks. And then that can have um, huge impacts on the, the circulation of the ocean and the temperature of the ocean. So if you're breaking off, like imagine what happens when you break off um, a freshwater ice cube into a, a salty drink of water. That's, that's completely um, changing the physics and the circulation of that, of that water. You're getting a fresh warm cap over the surface of the ocean that can um, completely change circulation. 